Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, citizens of the planet Earth, welcome to Club Cosmos! <laughs> Now that's what I call a crowd who's interested in science and interested in tonight's topic, which is synthetic biology. Uh, my name is Wilson De Silva, I'm editor of Cosmos, um, and I will be your host tonight for, our, for another jelly wrestle of science. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's topic is synthetic bio biology. What is it? What will it do for me? And can I use it to lose weight without exercising? These are the questions that half the panel I'm hoping you're going to answer. And we have assembled a distinguished panel of fabulous real-life scientists uh, who will tell it like it is. Uh, let me introduce them. Uh, to my right is Associate Professor of, and to your left, the Associate Professor is, is Desmond Loon. He's Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science and a member of the Center for Computational in Integri Integrative, Integrative, how do I say that? Integrative, Integrative um, Biology at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He was previously Associate Professor in the School of Mathematics and Statistics and Director of the Phenomics and Bioinformatics Research Centre at the University of South Australia. Uh, from 2006 to 2008, he was a computational biologist at the Broad Institute. That's a, a joint, it's an institute kind of trying to do some interesting stuff in science. Uh, it's jointly established by MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston and Harvard uh, University. And, he's a, and he was a research fellow, was a research fellow in genetics at Harvard's uh, medical school. Um, his research interests are, strangely enough, synthetic biology, but also systems biology, biological signal processing, and network science. Please welcome Desmond Lynn! <laughs> to my immediate left and your immediate right uh, is um, Claudia Vickers. Claudia or Claudia? Wow, Claudia, it will be, is responsible for molecular biology at the, and in the Center for Systems and Synthetic Biology at the University of Queensland's Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. Is there anything you're not taking there? I mean, bioengineering and nanotechnology are coming at all. She's a team leader for the Sucrose to Bioproducts and Industrial Isoprenoid Engineering Programs. You just made that up. Seeking to develop E. coli strains for sugar-based industrial bioprocesses with the aim of developing it as a carbon and energy source to replace petrochemicals. We need her, and her name is Claudia. Please welcome her. <laughs> and to my extreme left, and I don't mean that politically, is, is uh, Belinda Bennett, who is the Professor of Health and Medical Law at Sydney University. Uh, she's also a fellow of the uh, University of Sydney Senate. She was a founding board member of the Australian Institute for Health, Law and Ethics, and is deputy editor of the Journal of Law and Medicine, and a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Law in Context. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please welcome Belinda Bennett! Okay, I'm going to start where I, where I began tonight with my extreme right, and I don't mean that again politically. What is synthetic biology anyway, Desmond? Um, so that's not an entirely straightforward question to answer, as with a lot of things in science. Um, broadly, synthetic biology is um, about modifying living organisms to enhance their natural capabilities in some substantial way. Um, so typically we're talking about uh, doing something with microorganisms um, and a lot of this is being driven by um, technology for DNA synthesis for making uh, DNA molecules um, which is evolving at a very rapid pace. Um, so just you know, some examples, you know, we are, well, there are groups that are working on organisms uh, for producing various chemical compounds um, in cheaper and better ways. Um, fuels, biofuels is a large area, um, but then there are also drugs um, and, uh, and um, materials. Um, and then there are also applications in biomedicine in designing sort of intelligent organisms that can respond um, to, you know, to the environmental cues um, and help you know, fight pathogens or help fight cancer. So that's a pretty broad gamut you're covering there. Um, uh, 
are you saying that this is a completely new way of doing biology, or is it, if you like, going back to basics but using new tools? Right. So, um, just like just, we do about everything in science, we're never ever doing anything completely new, um, <laughs> um, as much as we'd like to claim that we are. So, um, so a lot of this is that you know, we, you know, is being driven, as I said, by newer tools being available. So. You know, genetic engineering has been around for a long time, um, but synthetic biology, I think, is something which is quite different from what you would consider normal genetic engineering because we can now do things that um, are substantially different than what was possible with, with normal genetic engineering. But this, Claudia, this also allows you to understand how living systems currently work, doesn't it? Yeah, very much so. so one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is actually looking inside cells and working out why and how they do the things that they do. And then once you understand that, you can take that information and you can use that to get the cell to do something that it wouldn't normally do. For example, um, make an industrial chemical or clean up a toxic soil waste or something like that. And it's actually quite a privilege and a really wonderful thing to be able to look inside cells, look at their DNA and their biochemistry, and use that information to change the way that a living organism behaves so that it can help people and, and make our world a better place. But are you just like introducing plugins uh, into the software of life, as it were, or are you actually uh, creating things from scratch? Well, really, I mean, we, we're doing both. so. We can actually take apart, or, or if you, well, let's just take it a step back and, and use the analogy of a computer system. So if you think of a living cell like a computer, so in a computer you have a motherboard and you have memory and you know, a mouse and a keyboard and all these little bits and pieces that provide functionalities for you to be able to access to do the things that you want it to do. So if you want to give a presentation or write a story or, or whatever with this computer, you'll use the tool that's required to actually do that, so software and things like that. With living cells, we think of them as the same way. So we're really thinking of them as programmable machines that we can take little bits and pieces from and perhaps redesign if they're already there or maybe do something completely different, create something that doesn't exist in nature now and get that to do something. And that's really important, for example, if we want to get the cell to do something that it really doesn't want to do or wouldn't do normally. And to override those control mechanisms inside the cell, we can then create something new that it doesn't perhaps recognise and it can't control itself in order to achieve the outcome that we're looking for. But well, won't you violate the warranty if you do that? <laughs> well, life doesn't come with a warranty. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> uh, but it's really, is it, is it fair for me to say that it's, it's really the reduction in the cost of um, you know, genome sequencing that has allowed this explosion of what was allowed synthetic biology to actually become a real, a real life thing. Is that true? Um, I would say that it's a combination of um, the sort of dramatic drop in costs of uh, DNA s s sequencing technology and DNA synthesis technology. So DNA sequencing allows us to read natural DNA sequences to take you know what's out there and very quickly find out what uh, you know what their DNA or their, their, their blueprint is. Um, and then DNA synthesis technology allows us to then write our own. So, you know, so this rapid drop in cost is allowing us to understand living systems uh, at the genomic level um, uh, much better than we're ever able to before. And now we have the technology to be able to, you know, to write large chunks of genomes and put them in. So it's not in case of just the cost dropping dramatically, because the cost has dropped. It's beaten Moore's law, hasn't it? Yeah, so the cost of sequencing DNA is dropping by 50% every two years. Wow. That, that's faster than, than Moore's law that we use to, to look at um, how uh, information technology is accelerating. And that's, that's a really incredible speed of technology. So some people argue, though, that synthetic biology is really just the application of synthetic chemistry to biology. Am I being unfair? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, well, I would say it's a completely different thing. Um, so, you know, obviously living uh, life is all about chemistry at some level, um, but when you're getting to the point where you are piecing these you know, chemical components together to make a self-replicating cell, that's, 
Yeah. And then and now we have the capability to modify that um, and rewrite it and make it do new things. I would say that's something that's very, very different. Well, I, would, I would actually dis disagree a little yeah. bit. I, I would Whoa, controversy. <laughs> I would actually say that, that there are a lot of parallels, particularly if you think of a living cell as a thing that we're engineering, and a living cell as a bag full of chemicals that we're actually manipulating. That's not so different from doing it in a test tube, except it's a little bit more difficult and there's a few more things that we have to think about when we're trying to control the reactions. Hmm, so um, would you say that um, then something uh, completely different would be what um, what Craig Venter created, Mycoplasma, Meocodes, JCV1, Synth 1.0. Why do they come to these names? Call it Tell Cynthia. Me. <laughs> Cynthia is what everyone's yeah. calling it. Is it okay? What is that thing? Um, so this is a um, uh, the first, if you will, um, completely uh, organism with a synthesized genome, chemically synthesized genome. So what this um, this guy Craig Venter uh, and his large uh, institute did was that they synthesized um, the DNA sequence for uh, for a living organism. It's a known living organism. They made some some modifications to it, um, and it has uh, a DNA sequence which is about um, about a million DNA bases long. So that's you know these individual letters of A, C, G, or T, about a million of those. Um, they're able to write that out into a DNA molecule um, and then put that into um, a cell that then took on that genome and used that um, uh, to make a sort of self-replicating cell. But it wasn't just a, a random sequence. They actually created a sequence that would do something, put it in the cell, and then it did stuff. Right. Well, they didn't really... It's a little bit unfair to say that they created the sequence. They took a sequence of an organism that's already out there. So we don't know enough uh, about biology of living cells to be able to say these are all the components that you know, would be required to make a genome that would function. So I guess you, you might actually say we're getting really good at reading and writing the genetic <laughs> yeah. code, but we're not 100% sure what we ought to be writing now, and we don't know enough to write the whole novel that would be the organism that we actually want to create if we're really making a completely artificial life. Um, so we actually have to kind of take a template from something that already exists and use that to, to sort of develop something that we can work with now. But, but I think that's coming. Which brings me to Belinda. You've been looking at the uh, legal and ethical questions around genetic diagnosis, globalization, the commercial drivers of biomedicine. You know, does this, do, these, do we have questions to answer when it comes to synthetic biology? Well, I think one of the key questions that we've got to ask ourselves is what is it that's new about synthetic biology? What is it that uh, raises new legal and ethical questions for us? And, and um, are we simply, in effect, um, going through the same sorts of debates that we've been through with other technologies? Uh, and, and if we are, um, you know, uh, is that going to provide us with a way of, of thinking through the issues that synthetic biology will raise? Or do we need to start from scratch with those ethical and, and legal debates again? Now, I, my personal view is that um, probably we've been through many of these sorts of debates before with uh, biotechnologies and nanotechnologies, um, and we can uh, learn a lot from those debates. Um, so what can we learn? What kind of the, the questions keep arising? You say that to an extent it's a, it's a similar sort of questions and a similar sort of debate. What are the questions? Well, I think from a, um, if we think about the similarities that might arise in this area from a regulatory point of view, we've already got, we've already had to deal with the issue of um, trying to work out regulatory systems for um, areas where the science changes very rapidly, um, where the science is very complex, um, where it's um, difficult for the public to understand, um, you need to translate the science into, into um, lay terms so that, so that it can be readily understood. Um, and so lawyers can understand it too. And so lawyers can understand it as well. Um, so we definitely need the help of the scientists here. This is very much um, uh, a multidisciplinary enterprise. Um, there are uh, complex, often complex ethical questions that get raised by science. So if a new technology is seen as a threat to human dignity, for example, we need to have some sense of what we might mean by that. 
uh, these are really complex questions that uh, we all have to tackle. And um, so I think that there's that there are a lot of similarities between the way that we talk about new technologies in different contexts, um, and we need to learn from those from those different ways. But there aren't. It's not like you don't have synthetic organisms now. It's it's true that there are things called knockout mice, which apparently are not mice that box and, and knock each other out. But apparently, something completely different. Can you tell us what they might be? Yeah, so, so a knockout mouse or, or a knockout of any organism is an organism that's had a gene for a specific function that we may, know, may not know what the function is removed. So we can then examine biologically what the effect of the removal of that gene is on something called the phenotype, which is basically how the organism looks after you take the gene away. This is like pin a tail on the donkey and when you're blind you kind of figure out what it's doing based on... Certainly if you don't know what the gene does, yeah. very much so. So there already exist uh, organisms that, if, to an extent, if you argue that you know there's, only, there's a divide between natural and synthetic, there are already organisms that have elements of synthetic, isn't it? For sure. Um, I mean, we've been uh, we've been using genetically modified organisms for industrial um, and food and many, many... And beer! Purposes. Yes, yes, that's Since right. Since about 4,000 BC. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is that right, 4,000 BC? Yeah, well, 4, synthetic biology is that old. Yeah, no. <laughs> <Don't tell me. laughs> yeah well, genetic modification is certainly that old. Um, perhaps it was a little less targeted than we do nowadays, but um, certainly, I, I, th I think, back to your original question, um, People really think of truly synthetic organisms as something that's a step different from simple genetic modification like removing and, and adding a gene. They're really thinking of synthetic organisms as, as something that, that are, that's completely new. So um, what Craig Venter has done, taking a genome and putting into a, a cell and kick-starting it and getting it to, to replicate and grow and divide, some people consider that to be synthetic biology, and there's other schools of thought that, that say, well, that's the first step in the right direction, but truly synthetic biology is when we can create a genome that, that we actually isn't templated off another genome that is really a new organism, and then actually get that to grow and divide. But the reason people got excited about what he did is the, there was no natural origin of those the pieces that made up the puzzle. He built every single one of those pieces. Uh, even there was they, a natural origin. There was? Yeah, yeah. So when I say templated, I mean that he used the code from an organism that already existed and he just cut some genes out to try to shape it down to what's called a minimal genome, which is the, the minimum number of genes required for an organism to survive. And then he added in a couple of genes that were markers. So when you see the picture of this thing, it's really it's quite pretty. It's blue when you see it on a plate, and that's because a gene was put in that makes a blue dye. And that was how they could tell that the organism was actually the one that they had created and not the original template organism that they used to synth synthesize the genome. So one of the, the really exciting things is that we can synthesize from a template or we can actually now create the sequences ourselves and synthesize completely what we say de novo or brand new, so really new sequences. Thanks for the translation. So the excitement here is this, that we're, we're actually talking about creating little mini factories that are going to do work for us. Is that right? Um, well, okay, so well, I mean the excitement, you know, was that um, even though we used the template, the individual bits, you know, that make up the DNA were were, were put together artificially. Um, as for you that's know, never happened before, and, and that hasn't happened before. Well, I mean, putting together, so taking an A and then a G and then a C and a T and then putting, you know, getting a whole million of those together and then putting all of them together, um, that's never happened before. Um, that's incredibly expensive and, and, and quite difficult. Um, as for, you know, and, and what you're alluding to is that that enables us then to be able to make novel organisms that can do things like service factories for us. And of course, in some way, we've, that's, you know, that sounds like we're sort of using these organisms to like, you know, exploit them for you know, nefarious means. But I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, obviously, we use yeast to make beer. Um, and, you know, and they are factories for making alcohol for us. Um, they don't seem to mind that much. Actually, they're really good at it. Yeah, actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a it's a beneficial relationship, isn't it? Um, both win out of the process. Mutual is a mutually yeah. beneficial relationship. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so does this mean that we're going to see 
um, factories of bacteria doing work for us. Is this open? You know, the sort of thing science journalists love to say is, you know, this might be ten years away, but this opens the door to. What is it opening the door to? What is this? Wait, there's actually actually more exciting than that. It's is not it? 10 years away, it's, it's here now, and we're doing it now. So we're making things like um, fuels, not, well, fuels a bit difficult, um, they're more difficult, so we're not quite to industrial scales of that sort of thing yet, but a lot of other things we're making chemicals. So there's a company called Jet and Core that's making a, a, a compound called Isoprene, and that is uh, polymerized to make rubbers so that you know, when you drive around in your cars, you can actually be driving around something that has been made from a microbial cell right now. So it's here now. So it's, it's just a case of what? The technology is allowing us to do this faster or do it better or we finally cracked something? It's, yeah, it's, well, it's more like the, the technology is constantly evolving, right? So we've been, we've been making organisms that could be classified as synthetic organisms for some time, right? So, you know, the kind of thing that Claudia's been talking about. Um, DuPont has an organism that makes a compound called 1,3-propanediol, um, which is used um, as a biopolymer. Um, and that's... What's a biopolymer? So, um, so they use it to make uh, materials. Um, again, it's... Uh, so instead of making, you know, rubbers out of uh, petroleum, they're proposing to oh, make right. out of... Um, so, so like if you, if you make polyester clothes, right? The ester is the monomer and the polyester is the polymer. It just means it's a number of monomers all joined together. Okay. Um, so do you consider yourself more of a biologist or an engineer? I'm an engineer. Wow, um, really? <laughs> Even though you're working with the wet stuff. Yeah, I, I'm not a scientist. So, I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a clear distinction between a biologist who spends his or her time trying to work out how biological systems work, um, and people like me who are much more interested in taking things that people already know and working out how to... That's know. intriguing. And where do you see yourself in that divide? So I, I'm trained as a scientist and I'm kind of masquerading as an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, really a, a, I'm really both, I guess you would say. What do you call yourself, Belinda, then? I'm just, I'm just an academic lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the safe answer. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, we're going to take a break now for uh, about 15 minutes and feed all the food and um, uh, visit the little boys and girls room or uh, to get a, yourself a drink. And then we'll be back and we'll take questions from the floor. So, take a break. Thank you very much. Woo!